I am Robbie Carmen. That is Patrick Inhofer. And we are indeed here today to talk about working faster together. And again, thanks, uh, big thanks to our friends at LumaForge, Sam, the whole team. Uh, we are honored to be here to talk a little bit about Resolve uh, collaboration. And I think that faster together uh, phrase is something that is really about the core of DaVinci Resolve collaboration. The fact is, is that we're working as teams together. We're not really on our own islands. And if you look at the development of DaVinci Resolve over the past few years, it's not just color anymore. It's edit, it's audio, it's now this year it's fusion, fusion and visual effects. It's delivery, so teams working together. And what the team at LumaForge Luma has been able to do by integrating the Resolve Postgres SQL uh, database server directly into the storage, all in this one box. I have shared storage and I have the ability to have that database server which is necessary for Resolve collaboration is killer. I can take this on the road as we have done here and in five minutes be set up to collaborate. And that's what Patrick and I are gonna show you today. Just a couple quick things on setup. We are using the Jellyfish. We're connected over 10 gig Thunderbolt adapters on our computers right to the Jellyfish itself. So we have fast, super fast 10 gig network. We're also connected over a regular old plain one gig uh, uh, internet or ethernet rather also to the Jellyfish, and that's our database network, as we call it. So here I am in DaVinci Resolve, and I've actually already gone ahead and created a database here in DaVinci Resolve, but I want to point out something about it. Uh, right here, you're going to see this uh, database I've created called LumaForge Demo. You see this IP address, right? The reason that this database has this IP address is because uh, the Resolve Studio supports the ability to use shared Postgres SQL databases, and that's what's running on this box. And so when I enter this IP address, this IP address is actually the IP of this box. So I can create databases from any of my systems and connect to any of the databases on my systems directly pointing to this box, which is very cool. And as I said, this database is shared. So anybody else in my team, in my facility, as long as they have access to this IP, they can get on board. So we're gonna do a little uh, role playing today, right? Patrick is a master colorist. Let's pretend that I'm his assistant for today. And as the assistant, I'm coming in at you know, seven o'clock in the morning. Patrick, as the master of colorist, you know, master colorist, of course, rolls in you know, around lunch, maybe one o'clock in the afternoon after his massage and everything is done. And Patrick has asked me to, you know, hey, can you please go ahead and get this project started so when I roll in, I'm ready to go. So I have a project that I've already started here. I started it actually last night. And I'm gonna go ahead and open it up just like I would uh, any other Resolve project. And right now you can see nothing in the project. Well, I'm simply gonna jump over to my jellyfish and I have a folder of uh, media from a trailer that we need to cut. And I'm gonna bring that in and start getting it ready. So what I'm gonna do down here in my, um, my media page is I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new bin. And I'm just gonna call this, you know, footage. There we go, I'm gonna open up my gnarly and pink folder, give it a second to parse all that media in there, there's some red stuff, there we go. I'm gonna take it all and I'm gonna go ahead and drag it in. Now at this point in time, I could conform the show, I could do other things that I want to do, but in some strange turn of events, Patrick has actually come in early today to the office, right? Yeah, my masseuse had to cancel, so I decided to get some work done before we go out for lobster for lunch. So Patrick, who's usually a big fan of yelling uh, across, you know, down the hall or over the phone, he's come in. And Patrick, why don't you uh, go over to your machine there, and why don't you try to get started accessing this project that I've just begun? So I've loaded up uh, DaVinci Resolve Studio on my system as well. I have connected to the database that Robbie created earlier and had come onto my machine and set it up. So now here's the collaboration demo project that Robbie launched over there. I'm gonna go ahead, double click to open it, and then I get really upset because it says project in use. And it's telling me someone else is using this project. So Robbie, what's going on? What is well, happening with my machine right I here? I am sorry, boss. I forgot to do one crucial step in this game. So back here on my machine, what I forgot to do was that you can have access to projects within a database, and by, because we're on the same storage, they're kind of by default shared, but they're not in a collaborative mode. So here on my system, what I need to do is come up to the file menu, and this is just a really quick switch. Under the file menu, down to enable collaboration. I'm simply gonna enable that option. I'm then gonna go ahead and save this project once again. Patrick, back on your machine, go ahead and refresh your uh, project. Now, camera. refresh, I mean, I just don't like being told to refresh anything, but <laughs> fine, refresh, and there we go. Now you can see that I've got this 
little collaboration icon underneath uh, the thumbnails for this project. Double click into it, and there we go. Now I am into our shared collaborative project. You can see the footage that was brought in. You also notice that I've got a little icon, and underneath that icon is the name of the computer that is accessing that folder right now. Well, let's stop there for a second, because one of the things that happens in a collaborative workflow is that you're not necessarily working in the same room, right? So how annoying is it to get you know, phone calls, Slack messages, et cetera? One of the cool things about Resolve uh, is that now we have the ability to support communication directly within the application without having to use a third-party tool and without actually having to be on the internet. So back here on my machine, let me show you that real quick. I'm gonna zoom in to my timeline, or not to my timeline, to the interface here. It's way down here in the bottom right-hand corner. Let me scroll down there. You see these icons here? Well, one of the icons that we have is this little person's icon. And if I click on that, I can go ahead and identify myself in that project. I'm just gonna say I am Robbie. Patrick, why don't you go ahead and do the same thing on yours? Got that? Got that. So um, the collaboration chat. So I can just basically come in and say, hey boss, what do you need me to do? Question mark. Right, now Patrick, on your end, what happens when I go ahead and type in that message? So when you take a look on my end, what you're gonna see in the lower right-hand corner there is my little bubble. It doesn't interrupt me. Every time someone addresses me or there's a uh, chatting going on, I don't have to stop until I'm ready to look at it, but I do get this little visual indicator. It turns orange on me. I click it and there, there he goes. Hey boss, what do you want me to do? I, and I'll write back, where the heck is my timeline? Because if you know anything about DaVinci Resolve, you can't start color correcting until you have a footage in a timeline. That's right. And the other thing just to notice real quick on Patrick's computer, see this little white icon? If Patrick hovers over that little white icon for a second there over the footage bin, it tells me exactly who that is. You can, of course, color code yourself to be whoever you want, right? So blue, red, whatever. That makes it also pretty easy to see. But what the point about this, as long as you have access to the same shared database, there is actually no even internet connection required within this. So this provides an offline way of communicating uh, without getting onto the internet. Now, back on my machine, I'm gonna do a couple things here real quick, actually. Uh, I'm gonna go into my thumbnail view, and I'm gonna find uh, this shot right here, Patrick. Just pay attention which one it is, the shot of the, the three kids right here. Okay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna come over, because one of the cool things about this workflow and the way that I use it in my facility is that I'll actually have an assistant be going through logging footage and making uh, notes about the footage while I might be doing another task. So in this case, what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna come down here and change my metadata panel, and I'm gonna come down and change it to shot and scene, and I'm gonna call this great shot of the kids, let's use, and I'll go, you know, uh, keywords, I'll put in kids, uh, skateboard, right, that kind of thing, right? Now, I can even go ahead and color code this clip. Now, here's the important thing. Right now, you guys would agree that I'm in this bin, correct? I'm looking at it, I've made changes. Patrick, on your side of things, you saw me in that bin, right? Because obviously, uh, you saw the icon there. What do you see now that I've made, since I've made a change to that bin? I was in the bin, I slept out of it for a moment. I was in the bin and it showed me a little recycle icon saying, hey, someone made changes in this bin. I can either tell it to refresh or I step out of the bin, step back in, and now when I take a look, you can see that the metadata description has updated on my end as well. Right, so the whole idea here is that it's a first in, first out approach. While somebody is in a bin, time Timeline or clip on the color timeline, while they're on that, they are the temporary owner of that item. Now, if I, if I were to come in here and say, you know what, I want to color this clip orange, I can go to it, I can see the metadata right. panel, but as I try to color code that clip, I can't do it. He owns the bin. All right, so He's gonna, the guy who can make the changes. I'm going to do what the boss asked me to do initially. I'm going to come back in here, and I'm going to come back out to my jellyfish storage, and I actually have an XML that I want to conform this project with. Uh, it's got some problems that we use in a longer demo, but I'm going to skip over those problems right now. I'm going to go ahead and just say, yeah, we already got the median here. We already got our project settings. Let's go ahead and conform this. I'm going to conform it back to that footage bin right there. So in just a second, I will go ahead and conform this, and this happens to me all the time in the workflow that I, and don't worry about the audio, I know it's missing. 
but I've conformed the timeline here, let's say for argument's sake, and this is great because I can start working on a version of the spot or a version of the show, and my assistant can be still conforming shots, loading shots in, and better yet, even placing them in the timeline. Now, here's a really important thing. I'm back over on the edit page now. Patrick, on your system, I want you to jump over to the edit page. Yep, so I'm jumping over to the edit page. And let's just say, you know, you want to do something here, right? So I loaded that, that timeline into that footage bin. I probably yep. should have created a timelines bin or something I like that. I thought I trained you better, but I know, yes. I know, I know, okay. you, I know you, yeah. thought you did that. But you get that little refresh icon. Go ahead and click refresh there. There we go. And voila, now you have this timeline. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and just, you know, and maybe just go, what the hell was Robbie doing? Let me get rid of this offline clip here in the timeline or, or something. Try to move something around in the timeline and see what happens. Yeah, I'm going to take some of these offline clips and I'm going to try to delete them. I'm going to try to take this clip here and move it and it's not working. I'm starting to get a little confused and I'm starting to doubt myself, which is always trouble for Robbie. And then I notice that someone else has uh, control of this timeline in the upper right hand corner you'll see there's an icon, and that is Robbie's icon that I'm looking at. And in very much the same way as it worked in the media pool, because I was the first one to control this timeline, I now have ownership of it. Nobody else can make changes. If we flash back over to my system real quick, I can, of course, say, take this, I can delete it, I can put this clip up onto uh, you know, track two up here, I can extend this one out a little bit to close the gap, et cetera. Patrick's on his system now because he's also on the edit page. He's going to see both up here in the, in the media pool bin, but also in his program monitor up in the upper right that there's an update. Patrick, go ahead and hit refresh. And just like that, the timeline is conformed. The same methodology, by the way, plays over into the color page. So here on the color page, and this is where I really, as a colorist, this is where I really think that Resolve shines with collaboration is that Patrick, as the lead colorist, right, he can go through the show, start making changes, right, um, going through clips, right, and I can follow up behind him doing specific tasks that need to be done. Now, so for example, right now, you can see on, on track, on clip number two here, right, um, Patrick is on that clip because I can see his icon. A clip becomes free when Patrick moves on to another shot. So Patrick, go ahead and move on to another shot, right? And now, if I click on clip number two, it updates just by clicking on it so I can see his grade. From here, I could follow up and do you know, additional grade work, et cetera, and Pat could move continually down the timeline, which is pretty neat. Now, it's a little different because it is on a per clip basis here in the color page, not on a whole color page thing. So whatever clip one of us is on, we own that clip temporarily. So the concept is on the edit page, when you have ownership of a timeline, you own that timeline. When you're on the color page, you own a shot, but no one can see the work you're doing until you cycle off that shot, and then they can see the work. And the really cool part about this too, from an editorial context, back here on my, uh, on my machine, is that Patrick could have gone and touched a shot as the lead colorist and graded it. There is nothing stopping me if I get a note from the client who actually says, I want to reverse the first two shots, right? I can go back over to the edit page, make that change, right? And you'll see that even if I go back to the color page, Patrick's original grade is still there. Not only that, on my side, it doesn't disturb me until I'm ready to be disturbed. So if I'm working on something, I don't want to suddenly see my timeline start modifying in the middle of my work. I notice I get this icon up here telling me refresh for some latest information. I can go ahead and refresh, and now the clips update on my side. I wanted to also mention that this works with stills. So one of the things to think of consider is setting up, you know, Robbie stills, Patrick stills, so you're not cluttering everybody else's life. But one of the things that you can do is if I go ahead and do, you know, some crazy grade on this shot, because I'm on it, let's make it awesome like uh, everybody loves, you know, neon orange, right? Uh, it's kind of like Blade Runner feeling that I'm going for, right? Uh, I can go ahead and, oh, it's a little more pinky there. I can go ahead and grab this as a still, right? 
And you'll see, actually, Patrick did the same thing simultaneously. Our stills are saved together. So in a master colorist versus assistant workflow, Patrick could save stills of the master look of the show. I could follow behind that using Patrick's references of the looks that he likes and applying various things and parts of that to it. Very cool. And the very last thing is that when it comes to all these other pages, right, the Fairlight page will work in exactly the same way as the edit page. The Fusion page, that's in Resolve 2015, exact same way. But the only page that operates differently is the Deliver page. Yep. Because we're not actually changing anything with the pro in the project itself, when we're just rendering out, anybody can deliver. And if you think about it from a workflow point of view, this is actually pretty big. I could render out the ProRes. He could render out the H.264, right? And now we're leveraging both systems to do double the work at the same time, and anybody on your team uh, can be doing that work. So guys, hopefully you now have a 50,000 foot view of collaboration. Uh, Patrick and I need to get out of here, but we're happy to answer any questions about collaboration. next door. Next door, uh, of course, as well. And again, thanks for your patience and thanks for the LumaForge team for having us here. Resolve Collaboration is very, very cool. Hopefully this gives you a taste of it, how it might be able to use in your own projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.